We've talked a lot recently about how Brexit is really built into this idea of um, this British national saga that we are somehow the superior continental um, you know, people. But that's not true in any way, shape or form. Um, and yet the people have been brought up on this idea and hence why one of the biggest reasons of um, not being part of the EU is that apparently Britain can, quote, stand alone, whatever that means. So, and we're about to find out how, how standing alone, how difficult that in, could possibly even be. But there we go. And like I've always said, if Brexit happens, we will back, be back in the European Union sooner rather than later. Because trust me, when people realise what they lost and what the Tories have done, there are going to be a lot of angry people in this country. And most of them are going to be Brexiteers who voted for Brexit. In fact, to quote um, a, a, an article we did, what, must have been a couple of months back, people who were in favour of the Iraq war originally, as soon as the Iraq war started to go badly, and, you know, it was very evident that this was going very badly, um, they changed their minds, even though they were in favour of it, to a point where they wouldn't say to, would say to people that they were always against the idea of the Iraq war, even though they were in favour of it to begin with. So I fully expect that to happen. So, how Brexit marks the end of the British story. Whatever the outcome of the Brexit debacle, whether the UK leaves the EU or remains in, it, it or it returns returns to it, or survives as the UK, or splits into two or three separate states, the, deba the debacle itself has already left a mark of closure, an ending to something that has been an integral to one of the major stems of British self-identity. This was the belief lingering after the end of the empire in the superior nature of everything British, the character of the people, the institutions of the state, the contributions made to world science through the culture and itself the global dominant English language itself. Britain was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, steam power, the railways. In the 19th century, it was the richest, most powerful country in the world. When it stood atop the world with its navy, the global police force, and operated a two-power standard, meaning that it was bigger and stronger, not just the world's next biggest and strongest navy, but the next two biggest and strongest navies combined. The pride and the pomp of the British in the heyday of empire did not last long. Two world wars impoverished the, impoverished the country and destroyed its empire. Our special relationship with the USA consisted <coughs> in desperately needing aid during the Second World War in return for a promise to dismantle the empire. Even if the UK could have maintained the empire, which it could not, as proved by Suez, it was effective tr uh, traded the empire for its survival in the 1940s. In the dour of the 50s and the, and the furbile 60s and the struggling 70s, the brutal realities were clear to the more astute observers. The phrase, lost an empire and not yet found a role, was on their lips. An entry to the ECC and EU saved the country's economy and saw it flourish, and offered a new significant role as one of the big three states on uh, of the big three blocks that emerged in the post-Cold War world, alongside the USA and China. A mature and intelligent uh, aspect of this new role and its great responsibilities seem to have established itself at the beginning of the new century, and expressed by the success and confidence of the London Olympics in 2012. But alas, there was still too much rot in the footboards. The British self-congratulation in the first uh, decade of the 21st century had given, had given a group of people in our political order a fifth column uh, from the past. The feeling that now was the time to reassert what they had mythologised as the spirit of Britain in Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. <coughs> oh dear. They felt that this was because of the conjunction of two factors. First, despite the world's financial crash of 2008, the British, com the British economy was in a good fundamental shape. And the second, 
The length of time that we've been benefiting from the EU membership was taking the country close as it was in fact, uh, in fact as they saw it to a point of, of, of no return beyond which their dream of taking the UK out of the EU could not be realised. Uh, their thought was, if not now, then never, and the conditions appear ripe. The Eurosceptics in the Tory party soon and unexpectedly uh, to be aided and abetted by the little rump of the far left Eurosceptics in the Labour party had been giving their own party leaders a great deal of trouble ever since the UK joined the ECC in uh, 1973. <coughs> their power varied intensively. With a number of Tory seats in the House of Commons, they, su they succeeded in getting a Tory Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, leading a minority Tory party in the House of Commons, and therefore uh, in coalition to commit to a referendum on the continued EU membership. There was no other reason for having such a referendum. It was purely an internal Tory party affair. The surprise win by the Tories in 2015, a gift by swinging to the left of the Labour Party, away from the successful version of a liberal left uh, social democracy created by uh, Blair and Brown, and it cemented Cameron into carrying, uh, carrying out that promise. However, very few uh, things have a single simple cause. The circumstances for the 2016 referendum, its nature and its consequences, have multiple causes that jointly led to the stupefying mess in the country and its political constitutional order that we are now in. The Eurosceptics made good use of these factors. They are as follows. First, there was a policy from 2010 of austerity and the large, resulting large and the rapid increase in inequality, which affected some of the country's uh, countries and the economy much more drastically than others. This was foolish and a short-sighted policy that did not reduce the national debt, but caused harm to the social fabric and hardship for millions of individual families. Keynes had taught, taught that you borrow and spend in a downturn and save the reply in uh, save and save and reply in an upturn. The Tories did the opposite. Second, there was a series of bad mistakes and misjudgments by David Cameron and Ed Miliband, the leaders of the two main parties. Cameron's mistakes were to offer a referendum, to introduce and enact a poorly designed referendum bill, to make a political promise to treat the result as a, mandating, as a mandate, despite the fact that no referendum can trump the sovereignty of Parliament. To regard himself as a lucky chap, so there was no need to make much effort in campaigning to remain, and to, resume, and to assume that the country would not be stupid enough to vote leave. Miliband's mistake was to change the rules of the Labour Party membership and for an election of the leader in such a way as to make the party hostage to the least electable and, as proved, the least effective leadership since Foot. His changes led to an influx of entryists from the left and their choice with the artificial block uh, power of the block vote of Len McClusty and the Unite Union. And, of course, this ended up as Corbyn as the leader. This proved that the... <coughs> The biggest helps to the Tory sceptics on the far right of policies because Corbyn, who, was, uh, who has learned nothing and has not moved on from his apprenticeship at the feet of Peter Shaw and Tony Benn half a century ago, is a Brexiteer and has, uh, and has abetted the Brexit cause mightily. Only very lately being moved with a sound of screening dug in heels and the massive Remain Labour members who, and the voters to less of the fudge on this issue. And third, there is the quality of MPs after decades in the EU. Membership of the EU brought a degree of general consistency and equilibrium to the economics and states of member unions. Everything, even, into, even taking into account the misguided austerity policies after 2010 in the UK itself. Uh, this has lessened the temperature of political debate in the UK. The premise is that it is, unlike, unlike most other EU countries, on a deeply uh, adversarial style of politics. Before joining the ECC, the UK was a theatre of intense struggles between left and right socialism and capitalism, management and unions, and a preserve uh, us and them mentality infecting every major decision. That moderated with a more temperate tone uh, entering politics in the period between the end of Thatcher and the post-2010 coalition, but 
a result of politics became somewhat less attractive and energetic. Clever and ambitious people with that uh, with the result that the some extremely honourable exceptions that the quality of MPs has not nearly been what it was. The banal careerism, the unchallenged sway of party whips, the unthinkable sound by ideas as a staple of political discourse, the fact that literally hundreds of Tory uh, hundreds of MPs in the Tory party can support a profoundly unfit person such as Boris Johnson in the office of Prime Minister. This is a mark of serious decline in the quality of these elected to the legislature. They are lobby fodder, lob lobby fodder, merely expected to represent the party line and, f uh, and far more than the interests of their country. Add to this the nature of party mechanics, so inflexible that in, in the Labour Party, for example, a deeply unpopular, ineffective, extraordinarily toxic leader such as Corbyn can remain in the position of leader even in the face of every indicator that he should be replaced, and one that sees an, obs an obfuscation in the country's political structures invites much blame. Fourth, there is the intent fragility and dysfunction of the UK's outdated and ramshackle constitutional order. The uncodified constitution, a series of understandings that no one understands, and it is very convenient for any party that commands a majority in the House of Commons because they can do whatever they like and always get their agenda enacted and controlling the business of the House of Commons itself. <coughs> Among many other problems, uh, this is the result of a key fail of the UK's constitution, which that there is no separation of powers between the legislature, the parliament, and the executive, the government, meaning the cabinet and the prime minister. In normal circumstances, the government is drawn from the uh, is drawn from the majority in the House of Commons, which means that the government controls the House of Commons throughout the whipping system of party control. Instead of holding the government to account, therefore Parliament is in effect the creature of the government. And it does not do what the government wants. This situation was, uh, was accurately described as the elective tyranny by the British Lord Chancellor Lord uh, Halsham, who, thought, who although a Tory politician, had concluded that with the system was unsafe that governments which control the legislature have unlimited powers and do what they like and in fact for the Westminster Parliament's abuse of sovereignty was dram uh, dramatised by Sir Leslie St uh, Stephen's remark made as long ago as 1882 that if Parliament decreed that all blue-eyed babies should be murdered the preservation of all blue-eyed babies would, would be made illegal. This is true today. <coughs> uh, as it was when he wrote that, as when he wrote that quote, it is dangerous enough, dangerous enough in itself. But now consider what happens when a critique, say, Eurosceptics come to ex exercise power over the government in respect of crucial decisions such as EU membership, holding the government hostage to their demands. The clique controls the executive. The executive controls Parliament. Parliament is absolute in its powers. The clique in its tail then wags the entire dog, and so as long as those in office are mature, intelligent, honourable men and women, they will in fact act with restraint, and restraint the pressures <coughs> to the will to the absolute power. They have, in what is what John Stuart Mill saw, as the chief means of maintaining constitutional morality in the state. But, obviously, when people of lower quality, less integrity, less intelligence and less honour populate these officers of state, the danger looms, and that the danger itself has bust upon us in the form of Brexit. <coughs> so every referendum held in the UK since the Irish, Irish unification referendum in 1972, and referendums should not happen in a representative democracy, has been held on a different basis. Lack of clarity and the constitutionally in important events such as these, it is mark of an unstable and fragile constitution. The doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty is very uneasily challenged by referendums. The latter replies, the latter raises the question, which is the authority in the state? Elected representatives with a due uh, with a duty to be informed and act in the interests of all, or an opinion poll of many people who are casting their vote on the basis of far more emotion than information. One of the major scandals of the 2016 referendum is that the outcome has never been debated in Parliament. 
the question of shall we take the advice of 37% of the electorate to take on an enormous, uncosted, unplanned and unpredictable step has never been debated and voted upon in our sovereign state body. And finally, on this fourth point, we need to recall that our hopelessly uh, undemocratic first-past-the-post electoral system lies at the rotten core of all these arrangements. It disenfranchises the majority of voters, turning them off politics. It puts majorities in the House of Commons on minorities of the popular vote. It entrenches the two-party politics in which elections produce one-party government by turns, with the foregoing of elective tyranny resulting in its mess and reform is urgently needed. It's urgently needed. And fifth, there is an, there is an availability uh, of the powerful new ways to practice the old tricks of spin and propaganda, social media, which allows careful targeting of messages to identified groups which only they see, so the others cannot contest the messages and correct the misinformation. This was a significant factor in the outcome of the 2016 referendum, as claimed by Dominic Cummings and Cambridge Analytica themselves. Some of the 37% of the electorate were persuaded by these means to vote in favour of a blank of a blank proposition with no plan, no impact assessments, no costings, no roadmap, and no set of policies attached to it. An astonishing achievement when you think about it. A very perfect con. The sale of a very high price of a tatty paper bag with an unknown thing or no thing in it. Put forward all of the four of the four going together, and you see that the UK is in a woeful state. And once the Brexit debate has been cleared up. I hope and expect, uh, expect by being stopped that there is a huge clean-up operation required in our political and constitutional order. In addition to addressing the serious inequalities and injustices in our economy and society, the slogan that we need to uh, that we <coughs> that we need to be shouting from the roof rooftops is not just stop Brexit but also reform. If we are if we are still in the EU. <coughs> Dear, sorry. If we are still in the EU when we do this, we can expect a double benefit. All the good of the continued membership with the greater stability, transparency and common sense in the government of our own state. If we are temporarily outside the EU, we need to get rid of the rot and the floorboards of our constitutional order in order to construct the mature, intelligent, responsible governance required us to get back on track. We in the UK have st have stated have skated on very thin on very thin political and constitutional ice for a very long time. The wealth and prestige of empire, the nostalgic dream it left behind, the self deceptions and illusions of those who could now uh, who could not see how good a future was developing for us in as a leading nation in Europe, and it made us unaware of the danger. We have fallen through the ice and the bitterly cold waters we are now find ourselves in must at last wake us up. I agree on that. Uh, really, nothing else to add on that. I completely agree. Uh, it's what we've been, what we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, con consistently. Uh, the idea that this nostalgia element has crept in, and that somehow we are the, you know, the mother of all democracies. That this somehow makes us great. We are not. No one has, has really, in recent times, asked ourselves, are we? A good democracy do we act as a good democracy have we have this correct good systems in place for us to be that the answer is as we've just gone through the article no so regardless of whatever happens uh, whether we uh, remain in the EU or whether we leave and we come back later we must have and reform our system and that must happen